Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's been a whirlwind this morning doing all the things that we do to get ready to praise the Lord. And I'm excited to welcome you here at our First Methodist Church, Rosenberg, where we exist to love Jesus, connect with others, serve the world, and reach the lost. If this is your first time with us, I want to issue a very special welcome to you this morning. We know it's not easy to step into a new place of worship, and we're so glad that you've chosen to join us today. Whether you're with us for the first time or you've been here lots of times, we do want to know that you are here. So if you would take a moment and grab the pew pad at the center of the aisle and fill out that information for us, that lets us know that you're here and lets us help keep you connected to the life of the church. If you're joining us online, we want to say a welcome to you and ask that you would make a comment so we can know that you joined us as well. A couple of announcements this morning, and most of them have to do with Christmas. Actually, all of them have to do with Christmas. Uh, I want to start by just letting you know that you've seen all these beautiful poinsettias up here. They have been uh, placed here to brighten our worship space, but they are available for you to uh, give in honor or memory of someone. So if that is something you're interested in doing, there are envelopes available at both entrances to the sanctuary, and you can make a gift in honor or memory of someone, and we'll share that with the congregation next Sunday. The other announcements are Christmas Eve itself. Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, so we will actually have our 10 o'clock service in the morning, which will be Advent 4. We'll be lighting the fourth candle of the Advent wreath and continuing in this sermon series. But then that afternoon and evening, we've got some special Christmas Eve services. At 3 o'clock, we'll have a new celebration for our congregation, something called Happy Birthday Jesus, which will be an interactive retelling of the Christmas story designed specifically for families. And so if you have little ones in your life, we'd encourage you to come to that service. It's a place where they can be themselves and make noise and sing and have all the joy of Christmas and celebrate in this space. We'll tell the story in here and then we'll go next door to the fellowship hall and we'll have a birthday cake and we'll sing happy birthday to Jesus and have a little birthday party with some crafts and some snacks and a time to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And then at seven o'clock that evening, we'll have our traditional candlelight service where we'll welcome in the Christ child with song and word and communion and candlelight, doing that wonderful tradition we all love of singing silent night. And so I invite you to come to any and all of those festivities and bring your family and your friends. Let them know that the light of Christ is here and they're welcome to experience it with us. With that, let's turn our hearts and minds to the worship of the Lord.
wonderful Advent hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. It's on page 196. You can find the music there and you can find the lyrics on the screen. If you would please stand and sing. coming of Christ and the restoration of creation. I'd like to invite Charlie and Susan Kingford to light our Advent wreath as we mark our journey toward Christmas. the second candle for peace. Today we celebrate the joy that Jesus the Christ child brings. Hear this reading from the Psalms chapter 16 verses 9 through 11. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see to heaven. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, <clears throat> with eternal pleasures at your right hand. We recognize the joy that only comes from God. When circumstances seek to define our happiness, we need true joy, and it is Jesus who comes to us with that joy. As we light the third candle, may our hearts be open to the joy that Jesus offers. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, we confess that true joy will never be found in tinsel of colored lights or the excesses of the season. True joy comes from you and you alone. We regret the times when we have placed our confidence in the things of this world instead of you. Thank you for the gift of true joy found in Jesus. As we journey for Christmas, transform our hearts to the ones filled with true joy of Christ for ourselves and for those we meet. In the joyful name of Jesus, amen. Now please stand as you are able and join together in singing Angels We Have Heard on High. You can find the music on page 238 or the lyrics on the screen. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3. children and then I invite you to come forward for a time with me. We're going to sit this time. Maybe. We might go on a little field trip. We'll see. How's everybody doing? What exciting thing happened on Friday? It was a big day for you guys. What was it? Yes, it was the last day of school before Christmas break. That was exciting. Any teachers out there, you are rejoicing as well. You get some time off. And we did come together on Friday night. And it rained, so we couldn't have a campfire outside. But we didn't let that stop us. We are blessed that we have uh, ranges in the kitchen that are gas. So we roasted marshmallows over the burners, and it was fantastic. Yes, and we had glow sticks, and we sang Christmas carols, and it was wonderful. 
because we do all these things at Christmas to remember how special it is. What a wonderful time that we have to remember the birth of Jesus. Now, we've started talking about the things that we see around the sanctuary that are different. What things do you see that are different? The what? Yes. They've been there a long time, those fans up there. Maybe you've never seen them because you haven't sat on the floor. What did you point to out there? The candle, like we normally don't have candles along the aisles and we've got signs that are now hanging in the back. If you're facing this way, do a little pivot. You can see we've hung up the banners. Yeah, we've hung up the banners. Yeah, we've got an activity scene up here that reminds us. Well, we're gonna go ahead and stand up. Stand up. Is Jesus in there yet? We've got a manger, but there's no Jesus, right? We're going to put Jesus in there on Christmas Eve. So we've got some special things. All right, we're now we're up. We're going to walk. When we come out here, we've got this beautiful greenery. And what's sitting right there in the middle of the greenery? A golden bird. How about a dove? A golden bird. We're going to call it a dove because the dove is a symbol of peace. And Jesus came to bring us peace. And we have all this greenery everywhere, right? We've got greenery on the altar behind our beautiful choir. We've got greenery up on top of the balcony because it's the only thing that exists in the winter that doesn't die. And so it, when we bring it in, it reminds us that God's love for us never dies, right? It's always with us. It's evergreen. What else do you see now that we're out here? What else do you see that's different? <laughs> the what? The diamond thing, right? We've got those cool banners up there, and they've got an angel on one side and a star on the other, because those are the two things that were in the night sky when Jesus was born. What do we have on top of our tree? A star, because it was in the night sky when Jesus was born. So all of these things around us help remind us of how special this time of year is and how great God's love for us is. And we decorate to remember all of that. So let's put our hands together and pray. And I will give you a sticker. And I will give you a bag, a s'more kit, some marshmallow, a piece of chocolate, some graham crackers. You can't roast in the kitchen right now. But maybe you could roast it later with your family. Or you can choose to eat it now. We'll also have the crate at the back. So friends, let me tell you, we had some adults who said they probably hadn't had a s'more in like 30 years. And we had someone who said, I've never eaten a s'more. So if, I know, gasp of shock. If that is you, we want to write that this Christmas. So we'll take those out there. Feel free to take a s'more kit with you. Uh, take as many as you need to celebrate with your family and enjoy this special time of year. So let's put our hands together and say a prayer. You need six? Okay, all right, let's put our hands together and pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this season of Christmas that is so full of light and color and decorations that point us back to you. We ask that as we look around us and take in all that is new and exciting, that we remember that it is Jesus who is the reason for the season, the reason that we gather. And though he is not in the manger yet, we anticipate placing him in the manger on Christmas Eve and celebrating his birth. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And as we get going over here, our praise band is going to sing a wonderful song for us, Adore.
from the outside who enjoyed that joy with us. And so as the ushers come forward, I want you to remember the joy that we send out into the world through our tithes and offerings. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the joy of this season. And we thank you for the faithfulness of the people who have gone before us, who enable us to spread that joy into the world. God, we thank you for the tithes and the offerings that will come in today, that come in through online giving and through gifts directly into the office. God, we ask that you would bless it all. That you would bless it all to your kingdom to spread the joy of Jesus Christ into the world. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
left me stand over at Campfire Christmas, and I realized it about two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a fun day, friends. <laughs> but we are in week three of our sermon series, Let There Be Light. And we have been thinking about light and thinking about how much our faith in Jesus, our faith in God, is captured in this metaphor of light. <laughs> How is the light around us affecting us? I don't know about you, but it draws me in. I find myself wanting to be around sources of light. Uh, we finally put up our Christmas tree yesterday, and, uh, and it was wonderful just to sit there and just look at the light, to be drawn to it. That's what we do. When we have these dark spaces in our life, we're drawn to light something to make it better. And so you know what I'm talking about. You know that this is something that we do. One of the most famous stories that we have in Scripture is about a group of people following the light. This Christmas story tells us about the lasting effect that God's light had on the world. And if we're going to follow God's light, then we can look at this story, the story of the wise men, and say, well, what can we learn from this? What can we take away from what they did, from their experience? And so that's what we're going to do this morning, is we're going to walk through this story in Matthew chapter 2, reading it in three different chunks, saying, what can we learn from their efforts to follow the light? But before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your word that tells us the story of light coming into the world, the story of Jesus Christ. And as we read about the wise men, help us learn from their story and their journey to follow the Lord. God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you, for you are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So we're going to go right into Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It's 1 through 2 is where we're going to start. Hear this word. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. So the first thing that I want to point out is that they came from the east. We know that. East to here. What's east to here? Sugarland? Fresno, I don't know if you go straight across, it's weird, there's not a road that goes straight to the east from Rosenberg. But in the first century, people didn't travel very far from home. One scholar said maybe like a 30 mile radius around where they lived. And so to come from the east would have been something out of the norm. Now there are different ideas as to where they actually came from. Some people think that they came from southern Arabia because the gifts that they brought came from that area. They were native to that region. Other people think maybe they came from Babylon and they were part of the remnant of the Jewish exiles who we hear about in the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel in those days. But wherever they were, they came. And they came a long way. Came about a thousand miles, we think. And when you think about that in the context of the first century, that's absolutely amazing to travel that far on camelback. Imagine sitting on a camel, having to ration your food, ration your water. There's no uh, Spotify playlist to kill the time, there's no Google Maps if you get lost. There isn't, you know, the app to bookhotels.com when you get tired. Like, you're just going. And they came all that way. 
Now, to give you a little bit of perspective, how far is a thousand miles? I found this map. These are different thousand mile jaunts around our country. So it's a thousand miles from Houston to Phoenix. It's a thousand miles from San Francisco to Denver, New York to St. Louis, Minneapolis to New Orleans. Yo, that's a long way to go on a camel, right? But like, we wouldn't want to do that. But they did it because they felt this call to follow the light that God had given them. And, and that leads me to my first point. The wise go out of their way to follow Jesus' light. They go out of their way. It's not an easy thing to do. They have to go further and farther. Be willing to be inconvenienced, to do the hard things, to follow Jesus' light. Now, I want to say this, following Jesus isn't easy. I don't think we say that enough. Following Jesus is hard. And I made a list of some things that I just think are hard about following Jesus. Repenting when we've done wrong and we've got to turn our behavior around is hard. Forgiving those who are terrible to you is hard. Turning the other cheek when someone goes low and you're called to stay high is hard. Overcoming sin that has locked itself into your life is hard. Kids, students, honoring your parents and listening to them when you disagree is hard. Sharing the gospel with those who don't believe it and you're worried about the way they're going to react is hard. Forcing the time to read our Bible and pray to God every single day when you've got your own agenda is hard. We've got to accept that following Jesus is hard. And I don't think we say it enough. And sometimes I think that gets us stuck. We're like, well, it shouldn't be this hard, right? It should be easy. Loving God should be easy. But that's not the truth. The truth is that the temptation we face means we have to go out of our way to follow Jesus. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be inconvenient. And there are going to be times that we want to bail. Let's just be honest. It's going to mess with our calendar. It's going to mess with our checkbook. But when we are willing to align ourselves with Jesus, it's a good thing. And it puts us at odds with the world. And that is hard. I doubt many of us really see it this way, but it's a choice between following Jesus or our reputation, what other people think about us. And we have to decide that following Jesus is more important than what other people think about us. It's hard. I think some of us want to sign up for, like, the less hard version of Christianity. That's not really Christianity. That's not how it works because God doesn't really give us an option. There's not like a level of membership to Sam's and Costco where you get to come in early or you have to come in at this time. It's all or nothing. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew. He says in Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and many enter through it. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. It's not easy, it's hard. 
word. And if you want the Christian life, then that's something that we have to understand. We have to understand that as we follow the light, we're going to be inconvenienced. We're going to be uncomfortable. And it's hard. And the wise men show us that. That 1,000 mile journey was not easy. So let's see what else we can learn from them, picking up in verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means at least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. Now, I made this comment that traveling 30 miles outside of your region was pretty odd. So Herod would have known that some folks who were a little different had come to town. He would have known that there were some strangers who had come, and people, being people, are going to ask, well, what brings you to Rosenberg? How'd you get, how'd you get to Texas? Right? They're going to want to know, how did you get here? And so he begins to find out that these folks have come into town. And he tells them that he wants to know where they're going because he wants to go and worship this baby as well. Well, I hate to say it, but the dude was lying. He was not interested in that at all. Herod wanted to kill Jesus. Because Herod was the king, and he didn't like this idea that this competition was on the horizon. And so this leads me to the next thought, this observation that I have in seeking Jesus' life. The wise know that not everybody loves Jesus' light. They just don't. If you've ever been on social media, and you start reading comments, yeah, I see head shaking and I, you know, there are haters out there in the world. Well, why do folks do that? I, I don't really know why. People are complicated. But one thing I do see in this passage is that people sometimes fight God's light when they feel threatened by something that God is doing. Right? King Herod wasn't really upset about a baby boy. That, that really wasn't what was motivating him. What was motivating him was fear. He was afraid he was going to lose his power. He was motivated by things outside of who Jesus was. He was worried about his own reputation. He was worried about his own little world. And sometimes that's what happens to people. They see God starting to move somewhere. They don't understand it. It's going to be inconvenient for them, and they don't want to be a part of it. It's hard to follow Jesus in these situations that require so much from us because there are haters out there. There are people who have had bad experiences with church. There are people out there who have trauma. And just struggle. And when we come around with our Jesus joy, they're immediately going to go to hate. Because it's easier to hate something sometimes than to ask questions and learn about it. And so we see that following Jesus is hard. 
we see that when we follow him, not everybody is going to love that light. But we're supposed to continue to follow. In Hebrews 11.6, it said this, God is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Do we believe that? Do we believe that if we seek after God and we do this hard thing, that he's going to reward us? What does it look like today to get on a camel's back and travel a thousand miles? Let's keep reading. After they had heard the king, and they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now there's a, uh, there's a funny video about these three gifts that's available in the Advent uh, study that I have shared with you. And they ask kids to kind of interpret what happened on Christmas Eve, like what happened. And, and, uh, and so they start, well, what are the presents? And uh, this one little kid says, Pampers, they brought him diapers. They need to bring him diapers. This other little boy goes, he got to do Nike basketball shoes, right? Um, and, and maybe there are more practical gifts that we think of, right? I'm pretty sure every young mother, like, you want a pacifier, right? You want warm clothes. You want somewhere for your baby to sleep. You want some way to take your baby with you. But he gets gold and frankincense and myrrh. And these are some odd gifts. But what I want to point out is that they were gifts with a purpose. Right after this passage that I read, it talks about the fact that Joseph has a dream, that it's not safe for them to stay, and they have to flee the country. Well, how do you do that? How do you flee the place that you've known, that your family is? How do you go into a foreign country and you live there in exile? Gold. He was gifted what he needed. There's that one gift that they could put to immediate use. The gift of the wise men was a miracle to Mary and Joseph that they didn't know they needed yet. And sometimes that happens to us. The wise give their gifts to further God's purposes. And that's what these men did. Sometimes your generosity becomes someone else's miracle. I'm reminded of the classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life. It's on TV this time of year. And we get to journey with George Bailey as he considers his life and the choices he's made. And there's this one scene where Clarence takes him to his brother's grave. And he says, look, you saved his life in the ice all those years ago. If you hadn't been there, he wouldn't have become the man he became to earn the Medal of Honor in World War II. Sometimes it's a little thing that you don't think is that big at the time that makes a difference for so many people in so many different ways. Our lives are connected and we might not always see how the dots are connected, but God does. And our generosity could be someone else's miracle. We have those stories in our community as well. I want to share two of them with you. The one dates back to a finance meeting in October. 
we were sitting around looking at the way things were going and we said we think there's going to be a shortfall and so we said we need our treasurer to kind of go through and figure out like how much it is how much do we think we're going to be short so that we can just tell everybody this is where we are and so i got an email on a tuesday telling me that number and i said oh okay that's the number and i didn't tell anybody just between the treasurer and i that we were going to do something with it the next sunday well the next day happened to be a time when i saw some members of the congregation and there was a member who came up to me and handed a donation over. That was generosity on that person's behalf. But it became a miracle to this community because it was that number plus a little bit more. And since then, God has continued to show up in the generosity of other people becoming the miracle for us and for others. I shared with you at the beginning of this month that we were renaming a fund, the REACH Fund, and that we would use this fund to reach out in the community to help people who needed it in various ways, help different organizations, help families. And I lifted up the fact that I knew of a family who needed some help this Christmas. And I said, we're going to take collections to the REACH Fund, and then we're going to go and, and be able to bless that family. And I had a number in my mind. I said, well, this will be what we'll bless this family with. That'll be enough for all that they, they, they'll need to make sure that it's a good Christmas and that there's food uh, to be eaten. And friends. I continue to get inquiries and texts and phone calls. How do we do that? How do we support that family? Friends, that family is covered in then some because your generosity becomes someone else's miracle. When we follow the light of Jesus, when we're uncomfortable, when we do the hard things, when we give what God has given us, we see his light not just shining in our lives, but moving beyond us and into the world. And that brings joy. It spreads joy. The Jesus joy that only comes from deep and abiding faith that isn't contingent upon our circumstances, but is only contingent upon the goodness of God. That is what we can learn from this gift of the star, from the gift of these wise men, that light leads to opportunity, the opportunity to serve God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the, the star that you placed over that stable in Bethlehem. And we thank you for the wise men who felt the calling to seek it out, to seek you out, to seek your son out. And we thank you for the words that Matthew recorded for us so that we could learn from them. God, we ask that you would continue to work in our hearts as we ponder the thoughts we ponder what you're calling us to do. God, reveal to us what opportunities you have for us. Reveal to us where you need us to serve and be generous with our time. Be generous with our talents. Be generous with our finances so that we can spread your joy into the world. We ask these things in your precious name. And now we get the chance to respond to that offering of joy, that opportunity that we have. We are going to enter into a time of holy communion. This 
table is open to all who would come who call Jesus their Lord and Savior and seek to live in communion with him and in communion with one another. In 1 Corinthians, it tells of this night. It says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the gift of this community. We thank you that we can come together today to worship you and to partake of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood as a reminder of that love for us. God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon it, that it would be for us a spiritual gift and a spiritual food, that through your great mystery, it would feed our bodies and our souls. God, we thank you that we can come to your table. We thank you for Jesus who makes it possible. And now we join together with the confidence of your children in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Body of Christ, broken for me. The blood of Christ shed for me. For those serving, please come forward. As they come forward, I want to remind you that this is God's table, open to all. We will receive by intention. You'll cup your hands and we'll place a piece of bread in the body of Christ. Give me the body of Christ. Give me the body of Christ. Give me the body of Christ. You will then come to the cup and you will dip your bread in the cup. Make two lines. When you finish receiving your elements, the altar is open for you to kneel and to pray. Any gifts left on the altar will go into the reach fund to continue to spread the joy of Jesus outside of these walls.
Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Son. We thank you for feeding us the spiritual food. Thank you for making us part of your family when we seek after Jesus. God, we ask that you would continue to work in our lives, continue to grow us so that we can love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Jesus and everything that he's done in our lives. We pray this to you, to him, and to the Holy Spirit. We all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. So our closing hymn today is the one that is perfect for this uh, week. It is Joy to the World. And I want to tell you a little story um, about this song that just is rooted in my heart. So I grew up in, I grew up in the South, y'all, in North Carolina. And there was a lady at my church who had so much joy that one syllable was not enough to say the word joy. And she literally would sing Joey to the world. Like a little baby kangaroo, Joey to the world. And uh, and so I love this woman, and every time we hear sing this song, I hear her singing that in my head. Um, and so I hope that you have as much joy as we sing this to be a double syllable word, but don't do it because Ryan would not like you to say joke. Okay, so just have the joy, but not the joke. Please stand and sing. May we follow that light and follow that joy, and in the generosity of our spirit, may it be someone's miracle this Christmas season. Please join with me in our Advent benediction. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and Peace and with the joy of the Lord.